We're going to talk about something that, for the believer, sounds like something that we hear, we hang our hat on, we build our foundation upon, and rightfully so. And the truth of it is, some of the time when we have heard something or believed something or held something so dear for so long, it seems like we don't talk about it quite as much because, well, everybody knows that. I know I've been guilty as a pastor of saying, well, everybody knew this Bible story. Everybody knows this particular verse. Or everybody knows that. So we, you don't have to really spend much time on that. Thank you so much. Son. That's a good sign right there. Thank you. And what happens is we tend to take things for granted, and then we end up with a generation or two that are either not as firmly grounded or begin to hold to a lesser esteem or value some of the things that are the most sacred. We've, we're all guilty of, of doing this. What I find is that believers today are not living in the power of the resurrection. And you say, well, what exactly does that mean? I believe Jesus rose again, yes. But what does that mean for me today? Well, it means a whole lot. Matter of fact, it changes everything. We do church so long and so often, and sometimes we even overcompensate or overplan at church, and it becomes this is what we do or this is routine, and that sounds like a good thing, but sometimes it sucks us dry, and it becomes what we do instead of who we are. I believe that's what's happening here at Belmont. I'm being honest. I believe it's happening all over the world, so don't think that I'm picking on you. Don't think I'm picking on us. It happens. But what is it that you do when those things happen and it becomes, nobody wants to say this because you're scared like this is going to condemn you to hell or something, but what, what happens when it becomes stale? I have a real hard time with wasting food. I, I just, it's a thing, right? And we can buy like saltine crackers or something if I'm going to cook a soup or something like that and let's say that it was one of those four pack boxes you know got a, got a good sized family there or whatever well let's say that we end up eating on it and eating on it and eating on it we end up with about three packs eating and you got that fourth pack and you open it for one or two things you know you, t you take your crackers you can take your medicine or whatever else but that packs already open and you forget about those crackers. Well, you got to do the same thing about three or four weeks later. What happens is that cracker, even though it tastes good, right? And it may even still be edible and be okay, but it becomes a little more stale. And I don't know about you, but I feel really guilty about throwing that pack of crackers out just because it's a little stale, right? So I'm going to eat that pack of crackers. What's happening with Christianity is nobody's wanting to admit that church has gotten stale. Now, don't worry, I'm not fixing to throw you some huge curveball. Matter of fact, I'm going to try to get you to where we're supposed to be, which is back to the basic. And I believe that what has to happen is the church needs to get back to the remembrance and also the application of the resurrection power in the life of the believer and break through the stagnation or break through the stale and not do church, but be the church again. You cannot be the church of the Lord Jesus Christ apart from the resurrection power. Matter of fact, you, you can come together and you can be a country club. You can be a nonprofit organization. You can even be a charitable organization. You can even see some people start living right. i got to be honest with you, all those things are good, and I'm, I thank God for those things, right? But I just think there's got to be more. I don't know about you, I think it's good. I'm not saying there's more than Jesus. I'm saying there's more to what we're called to be and called to do. I'm afraid that what happens, we get in such a routine at times that, again, it gets stale or stagnant. You know what you can do with those crackers, though, that'll 
actually this works believe it or not you know if you make a, a different kind of soup and you get it good and hot and you break those crackers up into it you don't taste that they're stale anymore because the heat and the the flame if you will the fire from it it takes that stale away but the crackers still give the same taste and soak up the juice of the soup you get where i'm going with this and what happens is that heat takes place there on that cracker and it softens it up and it begins to soak in the juice of that soup and you say man I didn't even know that they were stale I got one out and it was stale and then I put it back in my mouth after I put it in this soup and whoa I could never tell that that was three weeks old because the heat got put to it and it began to soak up the flavor and it could do its job if you will again at a higher quality I want to read the words of one of our foundational hymns that we never ever ever sing anymore and I will be transparent and say the ugly I don't like the tune but I love the words I'm going to read this to you and we're going to get in God's Word I'm wondering though if we could take what is now stale heat this thing up a little bit and see if there's still some good flavor here I want you to listen to the words of this hymn set my soul afire Lord for thy holy word burn it deep within me and let thy voice be heard Millions grope in darkness in this day and hour. I will be a witness. Fill me with thy power. Set my soul afire, Lord, for the lost in sin. Give to me a passion as I seek to win. Help me not to falter. Never let me fail. Fill me with thy spirit. Let thy will prevail. Set my soul afire, Lord in my daily life far too long I've wandered in this day of strife nothing else will matter but to live for thee I will be a witness for Christ lives in me set my soul afire Lord set my soul afire make my life a witness of thy saving power millions grope in darkness waiting for thy word set my soul afire Lord set my soul afire I want to ask you this is it possible that we could put the heat of the resurrection power on some stale crackers and once again be a sweet smelling savor once again be a flavor in our community you will not be able to do so apart from the resurrection power I want to take you to a passage of Scripture which again you usually hear sometime around uh, around Easter sometimes if there's a sermon series but John chapter 20 John is, get, is bearing account uh, with his record here again operating under the power of the Holy Spirit and the guidance of the Holy Spirit of God and yes remember this that God made sure sovereignly that the word was overwritten he God breathed it if you will and made sure that his word was recorded correctly but remember that God did not take John just totally out of the picture you still see the personal account that John's going to give here you see some of the personality you see some of the experiences you see some of the fear you see some of the excitement that John has and I'm going to share with you an old, old story. But we're going to fan the flames of the resurrection power today. John chapter 20. I'm going to ask you to stand with your Bible open. John chapter 20. I want you to look in verse 18. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things unto her. Then the same day that evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled for fear of the Jews, came Jesus and stood in the midst, and saith unto them, Peace be unto you. 
And when he had so said, he shewed unto them his hands and his side. Then were the disciples glad, and they saw the Lord. And then Jesus, then said Jesus unto them, Peace be unto you, as my Father hath sent me, even so send I you. Heavenly Father, today, I'm asking for that fresh experience, that fresh encounter, that fresh excitement that can only come from the worship of the one true and living God. I'm not asking for anything that is outside of the realm of your will or your word. I'm just asking that we would be heated up and that the stale would be gone, that we would be useful again. Oh God, help us. We cry out to you to be heated. And Lord, make us a witness. For just as you were sent, Lord Jesus, you have sent us. I pray today that lives will be changed, that people will be saved, and that Christians will be strengthened and challenged. And I pray that you'll add to your kingdom, add to your church here, add to the mission that you have right here. And I pray it now in Jesus' name. Amen. If you look for Jesus, don't ever go to his grave. You know, we always talk about seeking the Lord and he may be found or seek the Lord and uh, he will show himself and you. you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all your heart. We quote these scriptures and they're good, don't get me wrong. But here's the thing about it. Where do you go to seek? I'm not a very talented person, especially when it comes to things like tools or uh, gadgets or electronics or definitely not fixing stuff. So if you were to tell me, if I was trying to help you and you say we're going to build something and you tell me, I need you to run down there and get me whatever. Give me a five-eighths, whatever, da, 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 da. I don't even know what to call them. Okay, I don't mind, but you got to tell me where to go. Some of y'all would like to tell me where to go. Y'all can stick that. But I'm talking about, you got to tell me where do I go to find this because I don't know what it is. We're in the business of telling people about Jesus, but we never tell them where to go. You ever think about that? You need to give your life to Christ. Okay. All right, I'm in. You need to find Christ. You need to uh, put Christ in your life. Okay, but where do I go? I am convicted and I'm also 100% persuaded. And no, I'm not, again, coming down in a judgment for the cause of giving you heartburn today. But I want to make you aware, even if it's the most sobering moments you have in church apart from your salvation experience, people no longer know how to point people to Jesus. We have raised basically almost an illiterate people, an ignorant people, for a couple of generations now when it comes to our faith in action. Yeah, I had this last week and I got to ponder some things and got to think through some things. I'm, I'm even more persuaded now. Do I think we all started out to go that way? No, I think it happened. Right? And this is my thing. What do we do then? Well, we turn the heat up of the resurrection power. But if I'm telling you to seek for Jesus, some of you today, I see some fresh faces, some of you today may not know where to go to find Jesus. As a matter of fact, if you turn on your television, you're going to hear about a million different things when it comes to that. You read the best books that are out there, best-selling books that are out there, let me say, and they all tell you a million different ways to find Jesus. I want to start by telling you where not to go. I'm serious. This would sound backwards, but actually for the Christian faith, it makes all the difference in the world. You know where you don't need to go to find Jesus? 
Don't go to the grave. You're not going to find him there. You'll never find him there. <clears throat> if you think about it, something that we kind of overlook in, in, in God's word are some things that are not there, but that speak volumes. Have you ever recognized that after they had encountered Christ in the upper room, the disciples didn't care to go back to the tomb? I don't know if you've ever thought about this or not, but this, this to me can frame and change everything. I'm going to be honest with you. I'm, a, I, I'm, I'm sen very sentimental. So like if we take a vacation or something, I love, I've got to have a little souvenir from something. Now, it drives Jennifer nuts, but I'm trying, and I'm just that way, I'm sentimental. There's got to be something, right? Or if there's a special moment in my life, I like having something that reminds me of that, that something tangible that reminds me of that moment, something I can look to, something I can put in my hand, something I can see. I want to tell you something that will absolutely blow your mind. The greatest event in history, not only for the Christian, but even for those who are skeptical. Some of you here today may even be skeptical, skeptical about who Christ is and what he did or did not do and what it means to be a follower of him. Let me explain something to you. This will change everything. As, as Jesus had those that stuck with him, and those who even cared and mourned after he passed. Now, they were in fear for their lives, so they scattered, yes. They came back together. The Bible never records that any of them took a relic from that empty tomb. Nobody went over there and cut a piece of the cloth. Have you ever noticed that? The cloth was late. When they, when they were looking for Jesus, it was over there folded up. You remember that? Nobody went over there and took some kind of blade or, or took anything. They didn't take a piece of it and say, I can't forget this moment. Nobody took a pebble from that stony grave. Nobody got out a sharpie and wrote, Peter was here, 1985, whatever. You ever thought about that? I'm going to tell you why they didn't. They didn't have to. Because there was nothing there. The one that they were celebrating or mourning at that point was alive and back with them. It's kind of like this. If I go to a Bra Atlanta Braves baseball game, uh, you know, growing up I used to love Dale Murphy. I don't even know if any of y'all remember Dale Murphy or not that played for the Braves. Used to love back when the, when the Braves were real good. And then they had some guys, Jeff Treadway, and I mean they just had some great players go through there. Uh, McGriff, Fred McGriff was through there. David Justice. Uh, I mean, it's Ron Gant, huge Ron. I mean, the, uh, wow. And if any of them have bad personal lives, forgive me. I don't know it. I just was a Braves fan growing up. But you would go there, and they would be, they would hand you souvenirs. They would hand you like a couple of baseball cards, or they would hand you, uh, if if you had enough money, you know, a hat, or they would sometimes give you a free pen if it was your first game. You know, different things like that. And it was a souvenir for you to carry around with you and say, "Wow, I went to a Braves game back." in 1989 or I went to this or went to that or whatever you know the disciples and the ladies that were there I'm talking about the whole group of his followers not just the apostles none of them had to hold on to any relics none of them said you know we've got to we've got to use caution tape and block this place off it's now sacred have you ever thought about that it's done now because people want to visit and say wow what a historical site but at that point, they left the tomb and were satisfied and never had to go back. The reason they never had to go back was because the one that they were celebrating was with them. They didn't need an object. They had him there. They had him there. Churches are taking relics and objects all the time. We may not say that we do. But we're taking this program, or we're taking this way of approaching it, or we're taking all these things. Are programs all bad? No, it's, that's not my point. 
But we're taking all these things and saying, well, this is going to be the power that we need. Here's the truth, church. I wonder if we focus a little bit less on that kind of thing for a while and we got back to what the substance of the power is. The empty tomb itself is not the end all. It is the one who walked out of that tomb. What if we get away from the things that got us stale? What if we got away from the things that become, even in church, dare I say, idolatry? What if we get away from the routine of things? Not that tradition is bad, not that the message changes, but what if we get away from staying at the empty tomb and actually do what God told us to do and get out and tell other people that the tomb is empty because Jesus was in the upper room. I saw him. I was with him. You don't understand. I saw him there. When you get into studying the defense of the gospel called apologetics, one of the people, key people in this whole thing is Thomas. John chapter 20, where we're at, just a little bit farther down, one of the neatest stories to me in, in the um, in the New Testament is just powerful. Over the next couple of weeks, we're going to talk about this subject. Where you don't go is the empty tomb. Now, in no offense meant intended whatsoever, but just for the sake of stick, sticking with truth according to God's word. Many backgrounds, not just one, mean or, or try to pay homage to Jesus by wearing a cross around the neck. I've, I've had a cross, I wear a cross a lot of times, but it symbolizes to us what, what the love that our Savior has for us, right? When I was uh, born Baptist, I've uh, been Baptist all my life, don't get me wrong. I was Baptist before I was a believer. You get what I'm saying? All right. I, I began to have a Catholic friend in uh, middle school, and his cross looked a little bit different from mine because his had Jesus on it. Now, I thought at the time, I said, well, this is awesome because I, I knew nothing about Catholicism, you know, and, that, and I mean no harm in this, I just was always Baptist. But this friend had Jesus on the cross around his neck. And I thought, well, that's kind of neat. It, you know, it's, that's witnessing. That shows what Jesus did for us. I thought about it and thought about it. And, you know, again, I had my cross and I, I just wore it. And from time to time, I'd notice his and I would think and all that kind of stuff. It wasn't until way, way, way later on that I even settled in my heart. It probably wasn't the best idea to show Jesus on that cross around my neck. And I'm going to tell you why. I'm not downing it. So don't misunderstand me, but I'm talking about for me. The reason is, yes, Jesus died on that cross, I believe, 110%. Matter of fact, any, any historian whatsoever will not deny that Jesus was crucified, okay? All the evidence is there. Even those who are non-believers or are trying their best to prove that he is not the Messiah, we'll all agree that this man, Jesus, was crucified, okay? Well, let me tell you why the cross that I would wear doesn't have Christ on it. Because Christ is no longer there. If Christ had remained dead, I want you to think about this, it would make all the sense in the world to carry that, carry that around with him on the cross. Because that would be the reminder of our salvation. That would be the reminder of what was done. And when, it, when he said, it is finished, tell us I paid in full. When he said that, the last of the sayings from the cross, when he said, it is finished, that would be the reminder to us that he died for us. And yes, he did die for us, but understand this. He was then taken and placed in a tomb. So if I'm going to wear a necklace, then why wouldn't I wear something that had like a rock or whatever, a stone rolled away or something like that? Well, first of all, that'd be kind of hard to design, I'm sure. Or why don't we have a lot of images or 
or carved out things that showed Jesus actually being in the tomb, uh, even sitting up or folding the blanket or whatever else. The reason that we don't spend our time and our energies and our focus and our decorations or our, and even what we wear on those scenes is because he's not there. I'm not belittling anybody because I know some of you probably have this or some of you come from a background that do wear this. That's not what I'm belittling here. I need you to understand this. I'm just explaining to you that we tend to live our life like that. We live our life like Jesus stayed on the cross. He didn't. If Jesus died and that was it, we, like Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, we are the most miserable people on the entire face of the earth. There's no hallelujah. There's no hosanna to the king. There's no glory to God. Peace. There's no peace. Here's the thing about it. He was taken off, and, and you can't disagree with this. He was taken off, he was placed in a tomb. We can't worship the cross, we can't worship the tomb. We worship the one who defeated both the cross and the tomb. And I'm not, again, bashing the things that we hold as sacred or even use, again, as decoration. I'm saying that we can't live staying at the cross. We can't live sitting there looking at the empty tomb. Because if you don't remember, in Acts chapter 1, Jesus was back around with them. And Jesus started kind of going back on up to the Father. And he said, And you shall be my witnesses unto me, both in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria, and unto the uttermost parts of the earth. In other words, you will bear witness. You will be the testimony of me. And the gospel is going to spread, not only historically, but it's going to spread divinely. And I'm going to split you up. I'm going to send you to places that you don't even know about. At that time, the four corners of the earth, if you will. You're going to go all over the place, and you're going to, as Mark 16, 15 said, go and preach the gospel to every creature. I'm going to send you everywhere, all over the place, bearing witness, being a martyria, being the testimony, being the star witness, if you will, that you saw me crucified, give up the ghost, laid in the tomb, stone rolled away, couldn't find me there, pow, I pop up in the upper room. You're going to go out and share this. And no offense, again, to the decorations, but truthfully, we're, again, our lifestyle, we're living with Jesus still on the cross. Why? Why? I understand that Ecclesiastes even says there's a time for mourning and time for dancing. Well, let me explain something to you. You come to church, and people are more like mourning than they are celebrating. Here's the thing. Yes, there's a time for weeping and time for dancing, time for all that kind of stuff. Yes, I agree with that, all right? Now, and I'm not talking about getting outside the, the, the kind of God's order or God's command. So don't, don't take this somewhere crazy. But we are more along the lines of those who sit and have no hope than we are celebrating like we've got the blessed hope. We're still living, if you will, let me try to make it. We're still living like Jesus is still on the cross. That's sad. I don't know about you, but one of the most painful times of the year is Good Friday. I, I'm being dead honest with you. We do a Good Friday service here, a candlelight service. There's no celebrating. When Brother Jason and I were first planning, uh, you know, the very first one, I don't do anything upbeat. I want it mournful. I want it dark. I want it, uh, I mean, I want it... Focused on what it's supposed to be focused on. I'm dead serious about this. I, I don't want to hear something about how great God is and how great. I want to hear about my sins being atoned for. Because that day is what we set aside to, to honor that. But here's the thing. I even leave you on a down note that night. 
Because when we come to the sunrise service on Sunday morning, by golly, if we were in South Mississippi or Kentucky, I'd be saying we'd be having a hoe down. <laughs> if you would. We need to celebrate. But the problem comes in that sometimes we're even coming, even at sunrise services, or even on a day like today, which is set apart for people to worship God, the one who experienced the resurrection. That's why we worship on Sundays, the first day of the week, because guess what day he was raised? We do this to commemorate. Sadly, Christians are walking around living like they got Jesus still on the cross. Woe is being. We're living more like the age where they had to do the sackcloth and ashes kind of thing than we are living in the power of the resurrection. Seriously. Now, if you want to say that, well, I'm just a more solemn person, I'm, I'm a more reserved person, people can have different personalities and still be excited about Christ, so don't give me an excuse. I'm not having it. And I've seen you, some of you get excited at a buffet line. Don't give me, don't give me excuses. And by the way, you may can lie and get one by me here and there, but you're not going to lie to God. I am serious as I can be when I say this. Why do we have a bunch of believers that are carrying Jesus around on the cross rather than understanding he lives? He lives. He lives. Christ Jesus lives today. He walks with me and he talks with me along life's narrow way. He lives. He lives. Salvation to impart. And you ask me how I know he lives. He lives within my heart. Do you think you're going to win the world by saying, oh, you're horrible, you know, we're, we're, oh, woe is me. Woe. The world don't need no more of that. Truthfully, the world knows it's in bad shape. Nobody's arguing that. The world needs to hear what the fix is. The world needs to know what the hope is. The world needs to see where the change is. And the change is not the Christ that's on the cross. The change is not the Christ that's, that was there in the empty tomb laying dead. The change is in the fact that he was resurrected on the third day and he lives to give us life and life for abundance. I'm asking you this. Are we living in the resurrection power? Think about this, when Mary, who, was, who had been weeping, she even asked, when, when Jesus was there, couldn't see her too good because it wasn't even lit up. And supposing him to be the gardener, she says, if you have taken my Lord away, please tell me where he is. I mean, she's distraught. Some even say that part, and this is a, a good explanation, part of them say that part of the reason, even though it was, it was a little bit darker, that part of the reason she couldn't recognize the Messiah when he first called to her was she was weeping so hard that she probably couldn't see straight through those tears and let me tell you this if you've ever cried in mourning you understand you can't see straight she was in mourning it wasn't long ago she had anointed his feet with a precious spike nard if you've taken him away please tell me where you've laid out I, I need to worship my master even though he's dead. She was crying because there was no hope. He was dead. You see, the Bible tells us several times here and there. It says something about they didn't understand what he meant. She asked him, she said, if you know where they've taken him, please tell me so that I'm But it didn't take long when the shepherd called the sheep by name. They know his voice. I don't want you to get unbaptist on me here, <clears throat> if you will. I want you to look at the reaction. It's a little bit up from our, our verse for today. 
But again, we're going to be on this passage for, for perhaps a couple of weeks if the Lord allows. And I want you to see what she does. And I want you to tell me if this is a true, uh, a true uh, picture of what we are today or not. And I need you to be honest with yourself and to be honest with God. Or else this will make no difference. You go up and look. Um, let's just say verse 13 of John 20. And they say unto her... Woman, why weepest thou? She saith unto them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I know not where they have laid him. And she had said thus, and said, and turned back, turned herself back, and saw Jesus standing, and knew not it was Jesus. Jesus saith unto her, Woman, why weepest thou? Whom seekest thou? Now he already knew what was going on, didn't he? He was fixing to make a change. He was fixing to come on the scene. He was fixing to be the Savior that was no longer hanging on the cross. He was going to be the Savior that's alive. Some of you live like Jesus is dead. He's alive. Start living it. Start living it. She supposing him to be the gardener, saith unto him, Sir, if thou hast borne him hence, tell me where thou hast laid him, and I will take him away. Now, I want you to understand this. There's no way to know exact, the exact weight, what we're talking here. So I'm going to give you, I'm going to undercut it to help you to understand and just to play it safe so that I haven't given you what we call preacher numbers. You know, ex ex Let's say that this man who was a carpenter, uh, who would have been a strong man, let's face it, he was flipping tables before that, you know. So you're not talking about a weak little puny guy. So let's, let's just estimate and undercut it. Let's say 160, 170 pounds here. By the way, they had prepared him uh, with, all, with the spices, also the wraps and everything else. Some have estimated, and it's potential, that there would have been at least an extra 100 pounds put on him between uh, what they had done to prepare his body, the linen, everything else uh, laying there. You're talking about at least, at least an undercut. 250, 270 pounds, if that is true. And this one lady said, tell me where he's at. I'll go take him. I want to say this. Let the conviction start where it is. You know what bothers me part of the time in church right now, this is a little rabbit trail, but it's from God, so just take it. Part of the problem was there was a lady that was there to do all the work to, that was willing to do it. There was not a man that would stand up and say, that's my Lord too. Now, I want you to trace your history back through the years. Who is it that has typically held churches together? Who is it that have typically held families together? Who is it that have typically stood in the gap... When no one else would do it, somebody finds that faithful woman that's in there that loves Jesus and she holds it together, right? You get me? Now, there was a whole group of them, so I'm not just fussing about men because some of you other women don't do a thing except gossip at home, watch Young and Restless. And go shopping, get yourself in more debt. That's not the life that we're put out there to do. But this one faithful person was there, and she said, I don't care if he's 250, 270 pounds, and know that he, it was going to be more than this. I'm giving you an understatement. I will take him away. I want you to notice this. Tell me where thou hast laid him, and I, she didn't say we, I will take him away. Men, let me ask you, where is your backbone? When are you going to jump in and carry Jesus somewhere? Where you at, men? Don't crawl under the pew. We sit back and we let the women do it. I'll let the WMU do that. I'll let the women do it. Now, I'm not fussing and saying women shouldn't do this. I'm thanking God that you have. Okay, so don't misunderstand me. 
But what I'm saying is, part of the problem we got, not only in America, we got in culture, we got in the world, everything else, is the man is absent in the whole story and is not the one that's helping taking Jesus to somewhere else. We're not taking Jesus to our family anymore. We're not taking our family to church anymore. We're not taking our family and saying, no, you will not watch this on television because this is not of God. We're not, the men are not there and say, your, your school may have taught you that this world started with a big bang, but you need to understand, I'm your dad. God gave me charge over you. There is one God who created the universe. And as Colossians said, all things were made by him, and for him all things were made that were made. Dads are not standing up anymore and taking Jesus. We're leaving it for the women. And I believe with all my heart, and I mean this with everything in me, we're going to give an account, you sorry lazy guys, for being sorry and being spineless and not standing on your own two feet and leading your families. We don't have power in our families anymore because we gave it away. Nobody kept Peter from going to the grave, did they? Nobody kept John from going to the grave, did they? Mary went because she did what her master would want to, her to do. She went to, uh, to love and to worship her master. But it wasn't like she could rope Bartholomew and Andrew in and say, hey, you, you boys want to come help me? It's, it's going to be 250 to 300 pounds. I, there's no way I can carry this by myself. She said, you tell me where I'm at, I'll take him. And I'm asking in this congregation, I don't care, thank God for those godly women who've held it together. And I will say this too, in fairness, there have been great godly men who have also stood up at times and stood in the gap. But where there's a huge hole, not only culturally, society, psychologically, socially, when it comes to family, when it comes to ecumenically, when it comes to doctrinally, when it comes to theologically, and when it comes to just flat out living, the dads aren't there. And men, I will tell you this, when a man stands up, and I'm not talking about in a chauvinistic manner, so I don't want you taking this anywhere wrong, but when a man will stand up and love his family and be a Christ following man, it never fails, usually the family will follow. We're shipping our kids off school and saying, hey, go raise them. We're dropping kids off at church and saying, hey, church, you go raise them. I you tell them about the spiritual stuff. We don't have supper at the table anymore and talk to Jesus. I guarantee you, men, I challenge you. I don't know if any of you are brave enough to take this there. I dare any of you men to get your family just to ask one day this week and set up a time where you sit around the table, no cell phone, no TV, no radio, no newspaper, no nothing, and sit there and talk to your family about Christ and just see what happens. I dare you. I don't think you'll do it. You say, my kids won't put down their cell phone long enough. That's the excuse that I hear all the time. You're their parent. Get them to put it down. You're giving your power away. Mary did not have the power to, to, to tote 270 to 300 pounds of Jesus. Do you understand that? But she was willing to take him anyway. You may say, guys, I don't have the power in my home. I've lost this. I've lost it. You know what I tell my kids sometimes? I say, and it's, and it's a joke and we all laugh about it. But if, if we haven't had some family time in a, in a while, we haven't had that. I tell, I, I say, all right, all of y'all are grounded. Every one of you. I tell Jennifer she's grounded. Some of y'all are saying, boy, this is getting deep in here. Is it? This boy, he's, he's being a chauvinist right here. No, I'm not. But God called me to be the father in this home under my heavenly father. I'll tell everybody they're grounded. Get to the table. And now we kind of laugh about it. It's, 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 but you know what? About... 30 seconds after, Dad, and they put it down, we end up having to make ourselves go to bed, and we find out it's midnight because we've been sitting there talking to Jesus all night. So don't tell me it don't happen in 2018. 
It does. The problem is somebody's got to take Jesus and people aren't standing in their homes and doing it. And if you're not doing it in your home, how can I expect you to get out on the street and do it where you're supposed to be? And let me take it one other step because I know you're probably not going to see the pattern coming, but let me give you a little bit of, not prophecy, if you will, a little foretelling or whatever, not trying to be mystical, but just telling you the way things go based off of a pattern. We stop doing it in our homes. We stop doing it on our streets. The next strike is we'll stop doing it in our churches. We'll talk about the resurrection at Easter. And then the rest of the time we'll talk about how to change Huggies and how to maintain the nursery and how to um, have a thriving adult ministry and how to do We never live in the resurrection anymore, do we? Not that those things are bad. Power's gone. We get stale. And I'm telling you, unless we're examining the facts, unless we turn loose of the Jesus on the cross, unless we walk past that empty tomb, we're not going to get it. Jesus did not want us standing there because as soon as he ascended to the Father in that Acts passage, they were all still looking. They were like, oh. Any of us would have been too, so don't down them. This is crazy. This is amazing. God, he, he just—he was gone. He just went. He ascended to the Father. Tap on the shoulder. Why stand you here? This Jesus that you saw has ascended to the Father. Go tell somebody about it. What are you waiting for? That's the New King Josh version. Don't stand here and just look up. He'll come again when he's ready. You go out and be the witnesses and tell other people that you saw him. He lived. 1 Corinthians 15, Paul himself said over five, there were 500 at least, and there were actually more than that when you count in um, uh, the apostles and things like that. Jesus appeared to, to over 500 people after he had resurrected, and he was with them for like 40 days. And they saw miracles. John even recorded this. He did so much that the Bible can't even contain all the miracles he did. Don't tell me there's no proof Jesus lives. If I told you, uh, if, I, if I said something to you, somebody had done something wrong, we put them on trial in here. If I have two testimonies, if I even have one, it's probably enough to convict a person, right? Over 500 and you're telling me Jesus never raised from the dead? There's no proof? What else do you need? If I brought in over 500 people and set them down right here and they said, I saw this happen. I saw Jesus. I, I saw him appear. I walked with him. I saw the miracle he did. I saw this. If I brought 500 people, matter of fact, if I brought 20 people in here, you would say overwhelmingly, yeah, well, you got to believe that. It's got to be true, right? There's no court that would throw that out. Why is the church throwing it out? We're living like Jesus is still dead. Here's the thing. I'm going to bring this to a time of decision. I'm going to ask our prayer warriors and our praise team to come. I went over time, but I'll let you off tonight. We'll pick this back up next week if the Lord allows. My question to you and this is to those who are saved, those who are born again, those who have been in church, all that, whatever the situation is. Those who go, are a member of Sunday school, those who are a member of the church, those who have been baptized, everything else. Why are we stale when we're talking about a Savior who lives? Oh, my goodness. And you can tell me again all day long, well, I'm just not that kind of a personality. I've seen people who have a dry personality that at least smiles. So let me all come in here. You so sour dead ticks about to fall off of you. To those of you who have never given your life to Christ, maybe you're maybe you're skeptical, maybe you're searching, maybe you're out there and you're saying, I, "It's not that I don't believe. I just I need something." I can understand that. So let me give you something. I have personally been to Israel, and I've looked at the tomb, and I can promise he's not there. I've walked in it. He ain't there. 
promise. Thought with my own two eyes. Jennifer did too, if you don't believe me. If you're living like there is no hope, you're being deceived because there is. And as long as you've got hope, you will survive. Do you realize that? There are people who have lived and made it through extraordinary experiences. They've made movies about this. Like they've been pinned in rocks and things like that or whatever and survived like days and days and days without food or drink or anything. Somebody found them later. Or people that were almost frozen to death. They couldn't even move and they would rescue them. They'd find them and they had survived. And every time they interview these people that survived these miraculous situations, there was always something there that had given them hope. You want to know how you're going to survive? You Christian that's going through the tough time and you say, I can't take anymore. You want to know how you're going to make it? got hope got hope and as long as there's hope you can survive I'm going to ask you this if you've never given your life to Christ I want to ask you to come forward this morning and I want to ask, I want to ask you to give your life to Christ I want to invite you to do that if you have never joined this church and you, you believe that God's leading you here I'm going to ask you with reckless abandon I'm going to ask you to join become a member here does that solidify some kind of spot in heaven? No, but that means you're saying, I'm committing to being a part of the witnessing that's going to take place here as we try to transform this community. And even a little bit more important than that, I want to belong to this church who worships the living Lord Jesus Christ, and I want to start living like it. And you make a commitment. You make a commitment. Some of you need to get some things right in your life the altar will be open some of us will be here to pray with you if you like Jesus is calling you during this time I'm going to ask you to by faith are you going to be Andrew Bartholomew Simon or are you going to be Mary are you going to go and you're going to say I'm going to take Jesus or are you going to not even show up because it's not going to do any good anymore which choice? Heavenly Father, I'm praying that during this time of invitation that people will do business with you. And oh God, I'm begging you to work in a powerful way. Not for anyone else's glory, but for yours alone. I'm praying that people will be saved today. I pray that you'll add to your church. And I pray that, Heavenly Father, you would add to the mission here. And oh God, thank you for the blessed hope of serving a risen, living, and reigning Savior. I pray that people will submit to you today, O oh Lord, in Jesus' name.